Welcome back, everyone. So this is a topic that I've been wanting to get to for quite a while now. And so I'm pretty glad that we're finally starting, you know, this video here. It's long awaited. And so this topic has to do with pawn pushing. And the problem is, whenever your opponent pushes a lot of pawns, you know, this is actually relatively difficult to deal with. Yes, when you get to a higher level and you practice dealing with pawn pushing opponents much more often, I guess it does become easier to deal with and you eventually you get to the point where you actually look forward to it. You kind of hope your opponent does this because then it's a lot easier to play against. But especially when you're first starting out, it's actually fairly annoying to deal with because the problem is you know opening principles, you know they shouldn't be doing it, and long term, yeah, pawn pushing is not a good strategy, but short term, it's actually fairly difficult to deal with. And I think when a lot of people show examples, they tend to show some opening theory line where one side gets really terrible position by pushing pawns, and then they just you know show, well, it's a bad strategy, there you go. But the problem is when you actually play a real game and opponents tend to push pawns, they're usually not following opening principles too well. And so here I hope this will be, you know, these three examples that I created, I hope will be a, a little more realistic into something that you might see based on mindset. Because not always do the people pushing pawns always follow opening principles too closely. Um, but let's not be too cryptic about it. Let's actually get into it. So here's my, you know, three examples. Here's the first one here. So in this position, we'll be playing as white. And so we'll start normal. We'll play e4. You know, solid looking move. e5 is pretty popular. Knight f3. Solid opening principles. We're attacking the center. We're developing a piece. We're even getting ready to castle. You know, so th these are all pretty lo logical things. And I think this is fine. Nothing wrong with this. Probably, be you know, best for black is probably play knight c6. You could get the Italian game, the Rui Lopez, the Scotch game. You know, there's many different good openings from opening theory. One of the lesser ones, as far as popularity goes, is d6. This is the Philidor defense. This is also fine, but it's a bit less natural to develop, you know, to defend this pawn with another pawn. Usually it's better to just develop, um, but it's still not too bad. You know, this is still an okay opening. But as we're about to see, you know, the player playing black here is going to be pushing pawns a bit too often. And especially at the lower levels, if you don't know how to deal with this, it's actually fairly bothersome to deal with. So let's see how we can take advantage of this. We keep developing. We'll just play bishop c4, logical opening move. And then you get a move like a6, and it's not so terrible right away. Um, but, you know, this is, you know, I think when you see this, this, like, it's the start of, hmm, I'm kind of suspicious already. Maybe my opponent's not playing so well. Um, but again, it's not so easy to take advantage of. And so we'll just develop, you know, just play knight c3, more opening principles. b5, again, they're pushing another pawn, but, you know, they do this quite often. It's not a big deal. We'll just move the bishop. The problem with pawns is pawns cannot move back, you know, whereas our pieces can. So, they're, you know, their pawns advance, you know, the pawn can never go back and guard squares its left. So, like here, when they push b5, well, now, just because they've pushed this b5 here, this pawn can no longer guard the c5 square. This pawn can no longer guard the c6 square. And so, by default, these squares are already a bit weaker. And if we look at this position here, if we go back one move, right when, right when they just played this, well, right here, right when they just played b5, you know, we would notice that, you know, these, these squares are controlled by the pawns. You know, this is okay. It's not, not too much wrong with it here. But then when they push b5, not only is this square weaker, but now c6 is literally a hole. And what I mean by a hole is that it's a square that they cannot defend with the pawn. And so in this case, they do not have any pawns here. And so if white was to, in the future, get a piece on c6, oftentimes it's very bothersome for black because then they have to give up a piece, you know, to try and contest that. And once they run out of pieces, then you just have this permanent, you know, thing that's stuck in their camp and they can't dislodge it. So from a long-term perspective, this is one of the main problems with pushing pawns. Um, but you usually don't see that for many, many moves. So for the time being, we'll just move our piece back, and it's not a big deal. If they keep pushing pawns, you know, they'll be just hurting themselves long-term. So they'll play b4, because a lot of players who push pawns, you know, they keep gaining a lot of space. And this is why it isn't the worst thing in the world, because it does come with some pros and cons. It's not the best strategy by any means, but it's probably not the worst thing either, because you do get some benefits to it. But again, we'll just move our piece. Not a big deal. We'll just play knight e2. They'll play c5, 
Very common looking move for someone who pushes pawns. We'll play d3, trying to get our bishop out. You know, opening principles. I think castling was also a good move. Um, they'll play h6. Perhaps overly concerned that we'll put a piece on g5. This kind of thing is very common mindset from people who push pawns. But if you were black here, there's really no need to prevent this. You know, we, we would welcome something like this because it's really not that great and not necessarily just white want a piece there. So basically, by black playing h6, they're stopping a plan that white may or may not actually want to do. So I, I think h6 is a bit of a wasted move in that sense, as with most of these pawn moves. But again, we have to learn how to deal with this. So okay, so we castle. And this is a typical typical looking situation, I'd say, where you know our opponent has pushed a bunch of pawns. And again, these are examples that I came up with. This is not like some opening theory line, it's just... I literally put up the analysis board and try to create my own examples here. I think would be fairly realistic for a game. And in this, we see that white has four pieces developed. We have the bishop on b3. We have the two, both knights. And then also the king, whenever it's castled in opening principles, we count that as a piece. So these are the four pieces that are developed. And if this rook were to move, you could easily get by developed. You know, but white has pretty decent development. Here, white has... Drum roll, please. Zero. This is pretty terrible, because all they've done is push pawns. And by neglecting their development, you often get into a lot of trouble, especially if you can open lines of attack. And so this is actually what we're talking about here. So in this example, I wanted to show, you can actually open lines of attack sometimes when your opponent starts pushing a bunch of pawns. And the reason why that is, is because we have such good piece development. And if the position opens up, all of our pieces can spring to the attack, but their pieces are all stuck on the back rank. And so we're going to be able to attack quicker than they are. Generally speaking, you only want to open the position if you have at least two or three more pieces developed than your opponent. So here we have four pieces developed, if we count the king. And they have zero, so we have four more pieces than them. It makes a lot of sense to try and open, open up the position if possible. And if we go back a few moves, something I just wanted to show after the fact, because um, I didn't want to bring it up now. Um, but let's see, where was it? It was, um, yeah, so earlier there was, actually, actually we can even do it here. Um, but I just want to comment one good idea here is because we have two pieces developed. Again, they have zero, we have two. If you have two or three more than your opponent, it might even be a good idea to try an open line. So I just want to say that d4 was actually a decent alternative here. Um, but again, that'll be a different line, and I wanted to get something that looks more typical. So here, we'll just go back to it. Um, playing for d4 is a pretty logical idea, but here, because they've got so many pawns, you know, d4 is not really feasible. And so here, how can we open lines of attack? And this move might look a bit counterintuitive if the person isn't thinking, let me try and open lines. But here, there's one move that I would say is really good. Well, let's say it's black to move, so we'll give black a move first. Um, we'll have them develop a piece. So knight f6, the first piece developed. And so here, the one move that white could play, which is really strong, is a not-so-intuitive pawn to a3. And the reason this is good is because we're forcing a line open. We're threatening to take this pawn, and we're going to get our rook some kind of open file here. And if they do nothing, you know, or, you know, they well, if they take, we recapture anyway. And if they do nothing, then we still get the open file because, you know, we'll, we'll trade and at least we'll have a semi-open file for this rook. So a3, I think, is the best move here. Now, c3 also could threaten to open the line, but then we don't have anything on this file that could make use of it. Maybe we could, maybe we could get the queen into the game, um, but, you know, this is not necessary um, because the queen isn't already there. We would have to, like, invest a move to go here, and that's that just one extra step. I think it makes sense when, when we already have the rook perfectly placed on a1 to just go for a3 right away. And I think a lot of players who do not know this idea about opening up lines when they're ahead in development, they'll play a natural move, like say bishop e3, and they'll just think, well, opening principles, I better keep developing pieces. Or maybe bishop d2, maybe I can somehow like, you know, something like this, get the queen off the back rank, connect the rooks. And yes, this is a solid position. Opening principles are useful for that, but the thing is, opening principles are not always best. They're just a way to get a playable position and usually not get into trouble. 
But this also more or less assumes your opponent is also playing fairly well. And the problem is, we're not actually exploiting them by not developing and neglecting opening principles. Here the way to really exploit the fact that they have not developed, and all they've done is push mostly pawns, is to think, how can we take advantage of this? You know, the whole point why you develop a bunch with opening principles is to get a lead in development. But we already have a lead in development. We have four pieces developed. They have one. So because we're up by three, three more pieces developed than them, we can already start opening lines of attack. And so a3 is probably the best way to go here. And let's say they take it. We can actually throw in a check here. Maybe the bishop wasn't best here, wasn't really looking at a ton. They can block with the bishop. And we don't necessarily want to trade, because then that'll just help the opponent develop. We don't really want to help them develop a piece. And so we can just capture with the rook. And now our rook, although this isn't the most common way to get the rook into the game, you know, we've actually got fairly decent prospects here. If they take our bishop, we can recapture. And maybe they can go bishop e7. And yes, black very well might castle soon. But white is already slightly better, because we have a really good leading development. And we also have the open A file for us, you know, for the entire game here. Maybe we can put more pressure on the A file. Maybe this bishop can come out, we can swing the queen to A1. Maybe we can just keep developing and go for other ideas based on the fact of white's pawn structure, because they push pawns. You know, there's a lot of advanced ways that you could continue. But I think, you know, if, if you're someone who just goes by opening principles, you don't really need the specifics on how to continue. You just know you have a pretty good playable position. And your opponent has misplayed, we've opened lines, and long term, we'll have some kind of play. You know, we can figure out the tactics as it goes, based on what the opponent does. But here, I think white is already better. And so I'll end this first example here. But I just want to show the problem with opening principles, and it's, it's not a bad thing, because opening principles are still useful. Um, but maybe the drawback that's often overlooked is you don't always get a huge advantage. And so if I go back to when they castled, which is on move 8 here. So at this kind of start of this pawn pushing situation, you know, I would probably ask a lot of people who's better in this position. I think most people would say white is. And that's true. White is definitely better. But how much better? And I think if you were to put like an engine evaluation, I think a lot of people would say it's almost like white is up a piece. They're so much better. You know, their development is great. You know, all black is done. It's literally every move is pushed upon. And... Yeah, I can understand the sentiment, and part of it is thinking that, you know, my opponent has misplayed from a practical standpoint, and they have. But actually, white is only slightly better. They're not that huge, you know, of an advantage. The engine here says plus 1.20, so a little over one pawn. So all of this development, and white is just like, eh, maybe a pawn better. So, you know, the advantage is there, but it's fairly slight. And so if white was to somehow you know, blunder a piece, or maybe they would try a unsound sacrifice, you could actually give the entire advantage back, and black could actually be better. And so after all of these moves here, you know, we correctly learned how to open lines of attack. We got our, another piece into the game. You know, now we have the A file because we opened the line by taking here. Surprisingly, we're only a little bit, little bit better than before. Um, we only gained about a tenth of a pawn more of an advantage. So right now, it's like 1.3-ish is the evaluation for white. So again, white is only slightly better despite how black is misplayed. And this is kind of like the underlining problem with pawn pushing is it's not as terrible as it looks. Long term, yes, it will come back to bite them. You know, even a small move like h6, their king side is forever weaker. Just by this one little pawn move, g6 is now always weaker because they don't have this anymore to attack g6. And also, maybe we can sacrifice the bishop in some line, or, you know, rip open their king side, maybe even some kind of pawn lever, especially if our king was not castled on the side of the board. So, you know, there's always long-term problems with these little pawn pushes, but especially out of the opening, it's very difficult to see just how bad it is. So, this is the first example, um, but let's not spend too long on this. I'd like to move through these, since we have three examples to go through here. So the first one was opening lines of attack, and I didn't want an example in the center because that's common, so I wanted a way that we could open a line that was on the edge of the board. In this case, you know, a, the A pawn cap, capturing on B4. So okay, so let's go to the next example here. So the next example I came up with 
I wanted us to be the black side because I wanted to switch colors. This is not color dependent. You know, white can also neglect opening principles too. And so in this one, this example here, we're going to discuss how simply following opening principles sometimes is the best way. You know, just recently I was, eh, not entirely, but I was, you know, not too um, supportive of opening principles because it wasn't really exploiting, you know, the way that the opponent was playing. And that's true. But here, sometimes opening principles is the correct way to exploit this. So let's say white begins the game by playing f3. Okay, this is a not so great looking move. You have long term problems on this diagonal now already. Your king is already weaker. If you castle king side, you might have problems even on this diagonal now, just because of that one little pawn move. So this is not without its drawbacks. But okay, we'll just play e5. They're going to play this kind of joke opening type thing where they play king f2. Not not an objectively good opening. And so black will just play d5. Opening principles, we'll just control the center. Got a pawn duo in the center. Looks good. e3. And black will start developing. We'll play knight f6. Also one step closer to castling. White will play d4. Again, not too bad. You know, yes, they're pushing a lot of pawns, but at least they're trying to contest the center here. We can play knight, knight to c6. Just developing another piece. And again, this is an, another mistake that we're about to see here is, you know, this square, if I was the player who's white, I, I would not mind if they played knight to b4. That's not a good move. I wouldn't mind if black played bishop to b4. That's not really a great move. You know, it's committing pieces to scores are not really best placed. I would welcome that move because then they're moving a piece again, you know, when they should be developing new pieces. But here we're going to see the opponent play a3, which I do not like. Because, again, we're preventing something that doesn't need to be prevented. If I was white here, I would welcome black to play this. But a lot of beginners will stop moves like this because they don't really want a piece infiltrating their side. So here we'll just keep developing. We'll play bishop d6. And again, they'll make the similar mistake. I see this quite often. They'll play a move like h3. And so now black can simply just castle. And again, white has neglected their development by pushing pawns. And black is already slightly better, simply because they followed opening principles. You know, black's position is great. We've already castled. We have four pieces developed. One, two, three, four, since we're castled. King counts. And white has nothing. You know, this is not really developed. Um, the king is out, but, you know, <laughs> that's not really ideal. And they've definitely got weaknesses long term here. And so I think if black just plays a normal middle game from here, they're naturally going to be better. It's almost negative 2, according to the evaluation here. So this is a huge advantage for black, simply because white has neglected opening principles, and white has gotten a pretty good, or uh, black has gotten a pretty good position against white here. So okay, so that was the second example. So the first one was you can open lines of attack to sometimes exploit pawn pushing, and the second one showed that sometimes just following opening principles is actually the way to go. So now this third example, which I actually debated showing, but... I think it's critical here, and this is something that I've noticed, and a lot of people don't talk about this to fight pawns, is you can actually sometimes get behind their pawns, and sometimes that's actually really annoying, because pawns cannot move backwards. So, I mean, that sounds obvious at first glance, but if we play like this good move e4, well, that's great, but now this pawn, as good as e4 is, it can never influence the d3 square. It can never influence the f3 square. Same thing with d4, same thing with f4. Because this pawn is advanced, you know, a, a pawn cannot go back. Pieces can. All of the pieces in chess, all of these here, even, even the king, really, all of these can go back. You know, if they make a mistake, they can admit, you know what, that was incorrect, and they return. You know, if the position changes, they can go back, and it's not a big deal. But pawns cannot do that. I cannot say, you know what, eh, I don't like my e4 move, I'm going to go back to e3. Um, it simply can't do that. Once the pawn is advanced, it has advanced. And so the problem is if your opponent pushes too many pawns, if you can get behind their line of pawns, it's actually very difficult for them to deal with because pawns cannot attack backwards, and they've already passed those squares, so they it can no longer defend them. So it becomes very similar to the concept of outposts, where you can basically get a piece stuck in their camp, and it's going to be very difficult for the opponent to remove it. So, okay, so not always when they play pawn pushing moves is it some terrible thing that completely neglects opening principles and openings. Sometimes it'll start with a solid opening. Here, the Sicilian defense, that's a solid opening for black. You know, both sides are playing fine here. 
And so this isn't too terrible yet. And so here we have b5, which is, you know, this isn't, it's not too common. But as bad as this looks from a beginner standpoint, this is actually a well-known system. Maybe not the most popular, but this is the O'Kelly um, with the a a6 here in the Sicilian. And this b5 is actually a fairly well-known system. These three moves, this is actually opening theory. And this isn't too impressive so far. All they've done is push pawns. Um, but this is fairly equal. You know, this is pretty close to equal. White is only like half a pawn better here. Um, so it's really not too great yet. Um, but you, you can't rag on black just because they've pushed these few pawns. So, you know, it, it's not as bad as it looks yet. But we'll continue. We'll play bishop to e2. We'll just opening principles. If you don't know opening theory here, we're just going to try and get developed in castle. And something that's I, I don't want to get into too much. But I'll just show an alternative to bishop e2. Let's say white did know opening theory, which is unlikely because this setup from black is not a common one. But if they did know opening theory d4, again, opening lines is actually correct. And to give one sample line if they knew opening theory, it could be c captures d4, queen captures e6, bishop d3 developing, knight c6 developing, attacking the queen, queen e3, had to move the queen somewhere, and then queen c7 which is a move that the queen often ends up on c7 in the classical lines of the Sicilians. It controls a lot of dark squares. you know. So it's still a useful spot for the queen. And this is roughly equal. Um, so this is just one sample line if both sides do opening theory. Um, I think the engine is like plus 0 0.27 here, according to the depth I'm at now. Um, it's, a, it's shifting slightly, but we're about plus 0.3. So this is like a third of a pawn difference. This is in all intensive purposes, pretty equal. But let's say they don't know opening theory. Let's say this is a random pawn pusher who's just advanced a bunch of pawns. Both sides don't really know much more than opening principles. Let's still get a playable position. Let's still prove that white can actually still be solid here. So bishop e2. Black will play g6. Again, it's another pawn move, but maybe they're trying to fee and shadow the bishops. Maybe it's not so terrible. You know, it's got some logic to it. White will castle. Bishop g7. Okay, they've developed a piece. And so white can play e5, try and cut down on this bishop. Hopefully it'll make it almost like it's biting down on granite, as they say, the old expression. Basically just trying to hinder their piece activity. But upon pushing opponent, we'll probably play move like b4, kick our knight. It feels somewhat bothersome, but it shouldn't bother you. And a lot of people oftentimes get too annoyed when they push pawns. But again, this pawn cannot move back. This pawn can never defend these squares again because it's advanced to b4. And so I would welcome this. You know, if they play a move like that, I'll just move the knight. No problem. We'll just play knight e4. We'll attack the c5 pawn. You know, and that's fine. Pieces can move backwards, but pawns cannot. So, okay, so let's say they play e6. And the reason they had to play e6 is because let's look at the position. How do they get castled? Well, this knight probably doesn't want to go here. That's on the edge of the board. Doesn't have too many prospects. You know, unfortunately, we have a really nice grip on this square with the pawn. And so where else can the knight go? Well, e6 is the logical way to do it, just so you get knight e7. And then you can castle and hopefully end up okay. Um, but here, now we have this move, knight d6 check. And the whole point is just to make it so black will lose their castling rights. I mean, fairly straightforward so far. I think we can see white is a lot better. King to f8. And now we can play d4. And again, white would welcome opening lines, because black has one piece developed, and white has four pieces developed. So again, this is at least two or more pieces developed in the opponent, so we should welcome opening lines for white. And so there's actually a really complicated thing where we could look at C captures, and I'm going to put it in a PGN diagram, and I'll have all three diagram examples. I'll put it in the comment section or something like that. That way you can you know take a look at that on your own time. Have these resources that I've created. Um, but I won't get into it for the purposes of this video just because it's a very complicated thing. But from a practical standpoint, let's say black knows I don't want white to open up lines. You know, white has better development, which is true. And white will want to be probably opening lines of attack just because they have better pieces developed. That's also true. So maybe if black was aware of this, they could try C4. And this tries to keep the position closed, which, you know, in this case, they're still losing, so anything is not so great. I gave this as a mistake anyway, because C captures is slightly stronger, but from a practical standpoint, 
it makes sense to try and keep the position closed. Just push the pawn. So here, let's take a look at this here. We can actually keep attacking. We can go knight g5. Again, we're, we're using all of the pieces that we have in attack. You know, I think a lot of players, they would just keep developing. They would play something like, eh, maybe bishop e3, which is okay. You know, they could play something like rook e1, which is okay. But they're they're just going to keep developing. And that that's okay, you know, but it's not great. And this is one thing that a lot of stronger chess players, they understand, is that, you know, opening principles have their uses to get a playable position, but it doesn't always mean the best position. And the underlining point is, with by you developing, you're trying to get a much larger lead than your opponent. White already has this. There isn't as much use to keep developing indefinitely. You know, there becomes a certain point where you have to switch gears and go, we actually have to do something with this. And in this case, black is... Nothing developed, really. I mean, they have this bishop, yes, but this isn't really ideal. That's their only piece developed. And white has a lot more developed than them. So white is free to go on the attack. And so knight g5, already we're attacking this pawn now. You know, this, this knight is not hanging because it's defended by the bishop. And so how do they defend f7 here? This is fairly difficult to defend. They can try knight, f, knight h6, virtually forced, just to try and defend this pawn that way. But you can already see how passive their position is. We can go bishop c4, capture c4, that's fine. Knight c6, developing another piece, that looks fine. And now queen f3. And we're just adding more pressure to this pawn. It's very difficult to hold this. And so how, how could you hold this? Well, maybe you could try advancing this pawn, either f5 or f6. But then we have this e captures, and that, that might be bothersome. So let's see. Well, they can't go queen to e8. Knight would just take it. The only real square black has is queen to e7. And here, you know, there, there's a lot of good moves. Of course, white is much better. You know, white could play a move like, say, rook d1. I mean, that's solid opening principles, defends this pawn, you know, that the knight was attacking. It's not a big deal. Um, you know, you could play other developing moves, maybe like bishop e3. But again, this really misses the threat. Um, here, there's actually a huge tactical thing, which is not required to convert. I think if you if you weren't thinking tactically, I think rook d1 looks like a good move here. And you could probably play a pretty good position. White is much better. And I'm pretty confident that white is going to win most of the time here. Um, but if you are really tactically looking for things here, there's actually a really creative way here that you could continue. Um, and that, that move is actually, instead of this on um, here, we can actually go knight captures e6. And th this takes advantage of the fact that this pawn is pinned, so... You know, this pawn cannot recapture the knight. And the queen doesn't want to capture because of the bishop's location. And so the only capture that they have is d captures. And remember, we won a pawn on e6. And when they capture d captures e, they've removed the defender of the knight. And so we could actually win a pawn in a pretty clever way simply by doing that. Um, but again, this is, this is a tactical resource that isn't really required here. Let's say we weren't looking for tactics. Say we, for whatever reason, missed it. Just play rook d1. And so here's the position I wanted to address, where one side can get pieces behind the enemy lines and get some kind of attack into their camp. So the reason I went with this example, although it might not be so clear, and most people might think the outpost of the knight is what I was talking about, and yeah, that's sort of part of it. But what I really want to address with this example here is white's camp is more or less the first four ranks here. Now, this, this half of the board belongs to white, and the, the last four ranks, the, these should more or less belong to black. And so, you know, white side is, you know, the four that are closest to them, you know, blacks are the four closest to them. And with that being said, if we were to look at this line, you know, the fourth and fifth rank here, you know, the fourth being for white, the fifth for black, who's actually in whose territory? And so here, if we count, you know, white has two pieces literally in white and black's camp. And they also have two pieces that are influ heavily influencing squares in the opponent's camp. So here we have two that are already in, you know, black side, and two that are kind of looking into black side. How many does black have? Well, if we look at white's camp here, their side of the board, black literally has no pieces in, in white side of the board. In chess, pawns are not considered pieces in the same way. Pawns are simply pawns. But as far as pieces go, you know, knights, bishops, queens, rooks, even the king is a piece. 
there's nothing here. And so black is obviously less invasive to white. And not only that, but what are they actually attacking from a distance? You know, at least even, even with the pieces that aren't there, white is attacking a few things in black's camp. But what does black necessarily have? Well, yeah, the knight can look at a square that's in white's camp, but it's not attacking anything. The only thing that black's pieces may be sort of attacking is the d-pawn, and we just simply defended that with rook to d, rook to d1. So here, what I really wanted to show for this example was if one side pushes too many pawns, like black is done, you know, they've advanced all these pawns here, then oftentimes the opponent can get an advantage by kind of sneaking behind enemy lines, sneaking into their side of the board. And if you can get a piece into there, it's sometimes going to be very difficult to remove if you support that piece, just because their pawns are too far advanced. And it becomes even worse when you get that piece outposted like we have here. But even if it's not outposted, take a look at this knight. This is not an outpost. In theory, it could be kicked away by one of these pawns in the future. But here, this knight is still fairly bothersome because it's supported by the bishop in this case. And it's in enemy territory. So oftentimes, if the opponent pushes a lot of pawns, maybe a third technique you can use to try and exploit this is to get behind the enemy lines. So those are my three examples, those three ways that you can take advantage of pawn pushing opponents. The first one was you can open lines of attack. That often goes very well with opening principles, which is the second one. The second key you can use is you can actually just keep developing and using opening principles. And those two go hand in hand, like I said, because oftentimes opening lines is very closely connected, but I think it's sort of separate, so I counted as two different examples. And then the third example is you can literally just get behind the enemy lines. Because they've pushed too many pawns, it's very difficult for those things to remove what you have in the camp. You know, here we have this knight. That's very bothersome. Yeah, you could maybe trade it off, but, you know, if you were to relocate a piece all the way here somehow to trade it off, well, we could just, you know, bring this knight back and just replace it. And so the problem becomes when you do this to all of the pieces, you know, all the pieces are kind of tying down each other. You really want pawns to attack. And in this case, you know, th there's no pawns. You know, they can't simply remove this because this knight is outposted. These pawns have advanced too far. This pawn is here. This pawn is completely off the board. And, you know, it, it was on c4 and then it lost, lost itself. So again, you know, if, if your opponent pushes too many pawns, sometimes you get behind enemy lines and it becomes a very big problem. So those are my three examples. Like I said, I'll put these diagrams below in the comments. And I hope that everyone uses these resources. And you can always come back for these as reference. And best of luck defeating these pawn pushers. Because even though it's not a great strategy long term, it does come with some complications if you're not careful. Sometimes people keep developing. And they get an advantage, yes, but maybe not as huge as they would like. So if you notice your opponent is pushing a bit too many pawns, you know, maybe you can stop and think, which way do I want to try and exploit this? And so best of luck trying to navigate it because your advantage will only be a little, you know, kind of slight, you know, it's only a little bit out of the opening, but, you know, give it 20, 30 moves. Your advantage can really grow a lot. So here's the best of luck, you know, trying to get a huge advantage out of the opening if you can. And if not, you know, an advantage throughout the game, you know, a middle of game, end game, you know, whatever it takes. If they push pawns, there's always some drawbacks to it. So best of luck trying to find those drawbacks and I'll see you in the next video.